To welcome Alexandra here, she's going to talk to us about the French presidential elections, their impact on Europe and transatlantic relations. I couldn't think of a more timely uh, talk arranged by the Institute literally 48 hours after the first round of the French elections with uh, less than two weeks to go to the final, uh, the, the final round. Uh, and uh, in case we're, uh, I suspect that in case we're getting too sure that a Macron win will be a walkover, I suspect Alexandra may have a, give us a few thoughts that we might want to ponder on in the future. Uh, Alexandra is, uh, is director of the Paris office of the German uh, Marshall Fund uh, of the United States, uh, a well-respected and very competent think tank with which I am familiar myself from two postings in Germany and in the United States. She's had an extensive uh, 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 previous career in the foreign policy area, particularly with the French Foreign Ministry, where she acted as an advisor to the policy planners in the Quai, and she has also uh, uh, acted as an advisor to the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. Uh, so she has a very extensive experience of the... the, the the broad sweep of foreign policy and particularly of transatlantic relations. Uh, she's, a, she's a person of many parts. She has held down academic posts and she still holds down academic posts. So uh, I'm very grateful and the Institute is very grateful to you, Alexandra, for coming here to talk to us, uh, uh, finding time in your very busy schedule. And we look forward to hearing you, uh, hearing you over the next uh, uh, our plus uh, on, on, on this very important subject of the French presidential elections and transatlantic relations. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, hosting me uh, uh, today. It's a pleasure to be uh, among all of you, and I, I really look forward to uh, an interactive and interesting uh, conversation. Um, so, just two days ago, last Sunday, uh, took place uh, what we could call a uh, political earthquake uh, in, uh, in Paris um, because for the first time uh, since uh, the creation of the Fifth uh, Republic, uh, the two main uh, political mainstream uh, parties uh, have not made it to the second round. Um, and it's actually the first time that the center-right, uh, which have been rebaptized Les Républicains, uh, has not made it to the, the second round. Uh, you end up with a very close uh, result. Just to remind you uh, the numbers, uh, the front runner uh, Emmanuel Macron, who is not attached to any political party, but in fact created his own political movement uh, en marche one year ago, uh, did a bit more than 24%. Uh, <coughs> then uh, Marine Le Pen, 21.3%, uh, which uh, represents around 7.7 .7 million of voters. Um, so that's uh, huge because now everyone is focused on Macron. But let us not forget that this is a historical uh, score for the Front National. Uh, it's extremely high. François Fillon, uh, the centre-right uh, candidate, 20%, Mélenchon, 19.58%, and then Benoît Hamon uh, from the Socialist Party, so the party of uh, François Hollande, uh, the current president, 6.3%. Uh, so you basically had uh, four uh, candidates uh, that ended up being extremely close, and that's also, I would say, a, a, a quite unique, I would say, a, a result uh, for a French uh, presidential campaign. What is also quite unique is that between Mélenchon, the far uh, left, radical left, and uh, Emmanuel Macron, you can see that uh, they both created their political movement just one year ago, La France Insoumise uh, for uh, Mélenchon and En Marche uh, for Emmanuel Macron. Uh, why is this uh, a political uh, earthquake? Um, because um, you uh, end up having a situation where uh, the, both uh, the socialist and the center-right parties are totally fragmented uh, today with uh, very diverging uh, um, uh, visions of uh, what the party should do and the politics and the policies to, to follow. And so now uh, they have to engage in a 
rebuilding process. And this is not going to be easy uh, at all. And to a certain extent, we can say that uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, from the far uh, left is trying to uh, self-portray himself as the new leader of uh, the divided uh, socialist uh, uh, party. So that's for, I would say, the, uh, the, the very, I would say, immediate uh, uh, reaction. Uh, and what you can probably see is that these um, four candidates uh, that I just quoted, Macron, Le Pen, Fillon, Mélenchon, are probably have or have already reshaped the French political landscape. And as you know, and I, I usually repeat that a lot, especially when I travel to Washington, because it's difficult also to understand the uh, specificity of the French political system. Uh, this is not just a presidential election. Um, you have to look at the French uh, presidential election as a four round election, because after May the 7th, we will have two rounds for the legislative elections on June 11 and June 18. Uh, and if uh, the uh, elected president, either Macron or Marine Le Pen, do not succeed to have a majority at the parliament, they will be very much constrained in terms of what they can actually do and implement in terms of their program, both domestically, but also uh, in terms of foreign and security uh, uh, policy. So this is really something that we have to be very uh, careful about and Macron now is actively engaged as he has just created his movement. It's really a very recent movement one year ago. He has now to build uh, in a few days uh, a new majority uh, at the, the, the parliament uh, and this is going to be uh, a big uh, challenge uh, for, for him. Uh, the second uh, takeaway that I, I, I take from these uh, elections um, is that um, this is the first time also that a French presidential campaign uh, takes place under the so-called state of emergency. Uh, you might have followed uh, the certain amount of anxiety uh, within which these elections have uh, taken place. Um, the latest uh, terrorist attacks on the Champs-Élysées and other terrorist attacks that have been uh, avoided and uh, prevented. Uh, but also, it's interesting to see how um, these uh, uh, terrorist attacks attempts or uh, 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 the one that took place on the Champs-Élysées has not changed that much the final result. And in fact, uh, I mean, Marine Le Pen can be very happy uh, to be in the second round, but you can also sense a big amount of disappointment that she didn't end up being the front, uh, the front runner. And so to say, you know, uh, what could get Marine Le Pen uh, elected uh, next May 7th, a uh, terrorist attack, uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so, and it didn't help her at all in the, in the, first, uh, in the first round. What could actually help her is a low uh, turnout, uh, that's for sure. Um, but again, the first round showed that the turnout has been much higher than what had been predicted, and I would predict a much higher turnout uh, for the second round than what we are currently talking about. So I'm not uh, particularly concerned uh, about, um, about that. Um, so that, I would say, is for the uh, particularity of this uh, 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 presidential um, presidential uh, uh, campaign. Um, the discussions, the debates, the divides have not been between uh, the right and the left and the programs and <coughs> that they, they promote. It has really been uh, a lot about uh, pro-Europe, anti-Europe, uh, pro-globalization, anti-globalization, but also um, to a certain extent, we could uh, compare that to the US elections, a urban uh, rural uh, divide. Uh, and if you uh, take, for example, uh, the, uh, the map um, of how uh, the voters actually voted, it's really striking to see how this divide has been uh, reinforcing and deepening uh, these last uh, years. Uh, basically, uh, the big uh, urban uh, 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 cities have voted uh, massively for Macron and uh, uh, for Fillon uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the map next to it is Marine Le Pen uh, map. You can see that the northeast and the south uh, regions have massively voted for uh, Marine Le Pen. Then uh, when you look at who voted uh, for who, it's extremely interesting. 
Uh, Macron has the most balanced, I would say, um, uh, electorate. Uh, so he is the one who has uh, taken the most votes uh, for uh, from uh, the uh, um, um, intellectuals, uh, from um, high-ranking uh, peoples working in, in companies, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, employees workers and uh, and employers uh, um, actually people without jobs have uh, voted almost 18 uh, percent for him marine le pen it's very clear she has succeeded her normalization strategy and she has also succeeded to take a large part of the traditional far left um, uh, electorate uh, for example workers have voted almost 40 percent uh, for her uh, employees first 30% and um, people without jobs almost 30%. Uh, percent. Uh, but then in the higher categories, uh, people have voted much less uh, for, for her. And so this tells you a lot also about, um, I would say, the, the result uh, from this, uh, this election. Um, so what you're going to have uh, in between the two rounds uh, is now a battle uh, of uh, visions, a battle of completely opposite visions. You could not have had more opposite visions than uh, Le Pen uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 Macron. Uh, they both portray themselves as uh, political outsiders. In fact, they are not. Uh, that's a total uh, myth. Uh, Macron is a pure product of uh, uh, the classic curriculum of a political elite with the ENA school. Uh, he has been François Hollande's economic advisor, then economy uh, uh, minister. And Marine Le Pen has been in politics uh, for now or several decades, and even more through her father, uh, Jean-Marie uh, uh, Le Pen. Um, they both portray themselves as, uh, as, as they say, the alternative uh, of the alternance, the alternative to uh, the right and uh, uh, the left. Uh, they both express dissatisfaction with the current uh, political uh, status quo. But in fact, they defend radically different visions uh, for French society, French economy, uh, France's role in Europe, uh, and France's role in the world, but also relationship vis-à-vis uh, -vis Russia and uh, the, uh, the United States. We can get more into the details in the, uh, in the, the discussion part. I would say basically now Macron's uh, uh, challenge is going to be to show that he is not going to be a president of uh, this expression that is often used when, when talking about Macron of uh, Hollandisme bis, of a second mandate for President Hollande. And that's a challenge for him. In fact, as you've seen, Hollande himself yesterday just said that he was supporting Emmanuel Macron. Well, he cannot really do otherwise. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the contrary would have been uh, uh, surprising. Uh, all of the traditional socialist uh, figures are uh, supporting him very visibly and, and tangibly. Um, and that's going to be difficult, uh, difficult for him. He will have to try to show that he can surround himself with the new faces. Um, he um, um, has deployed um, a uh, strategy, uh, actually, uh, in the different uh, departments uh, in the country for the, in terms of the legislative elections, putting the focus on <coughs> encouraging people from civil society <coughs> from the private sector, much more women, much more younger people to join his, uh, his movement. So that's something he has been really putting the, uh, the focus on. Um, and, ha and he really has to show that he has, in fact, an alternative vision uh, for French politics and an alternative vision uh, for France's role in, um, in, in, uh, in Europe and in uh, the world at the time where uh, the current French president, François Hollande's uh, popularity rate has declined to uh, 4%, uh, which is really uh, historically uh, extremely, uh, extremely um, uh, low. So what you are seeing now is people from the right, from the left, from the center, rallying around Emmanuel Macron. Uh, you have the same scenario than we had in 2002 when you had Chirac and uh, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, what we call le Front Républicain, uh, this sort of rallying around the flag uh, of uh, different uh, parties uh, to block 
uh, the uh, scenario of having uh, the far right uh, uh, reaching uh, the, um, the uh, uh, Elysee. The scenarios right now that we see happening is that Macron obviously has very high chances of becoming the next uh, French uh, president. Uh, if so, he would be uh, the youngest uh, president uh, in the entire French political history, 39 years old. Um, he still has um, a lot of um, experience uh, to, uh, to build, especially in terms of uh, foreign policy. Um, but uh, I think that he represents, uh, because also of his uh, youth, of his optimism, he's the only one actually to have con conducted an optimistic campaign on optimistic, pro-European, uh, outward-looking vision of what France should be uh, in Europe and in the world, has attracted uh, a lot of young uh, voters. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, voters who have been, you know, hesitating between the center right, <coughs> center left, and because of his discourse, neither left, neither right, I want to federate all those who believe in the idea of the center, uh, has worked, uh, and his campaign has been to that extent exceptional. Uh, and to the same extent that uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon's on the far left campaign has been exceptional uh, um, uh, as well. Um, what does it mean in terms of the, um, I would say, um, foreign policy uh, issues? Because obviously uh, Le Pen and Macron uh, would be very different uh, uh, presidents in terms of their uh, uh, vision uh, for France in Europe and, and the world. What has been interesting with this campaign in particular is that because of the international context, um, Brexit, uh, Trump's uh, election, um, it has been striking to me how foreign policy has been much more present in this campaign than in any other uh, campaign and has to a certain extent forced uh, uh, the different candidates to position themselves on foreign policy issues. Uh, the number one issue being uh, uh, Trump, at least at the beginning of the, the campaign. And there you have a very different, I would say, uh, perspective when you look at Le Pen and uh, Macron. Uh, Macron has, um, I would say, traditional approach to the US, French, and I would say more broadly transatlantic relationship. He said several times uh, that he believes that a strong French-US relationship is important, and especially in terms of cooperation and intelligence sharing uh, in fighting uh, terrorism. Um, and this obviously will be, if I can say, business as usual uh, compared to uh, the previous uh, Hollande uh, uh, presidency. But he has also been uh, the only, actually, candidate to have uh, vocally opposed uh, Trump on many of his policies and decisions, the immigration ban, his protectionist uh, policies, and he has, you know, uh, actually invited uh, uh, U.S. scientists, academics, entrepreneurs who are at odds with Trump to actually move to France, uh, just like he did so with uh, the British, <laughs> who do not agree with Brexit, and he said, you know, in his pro-business approach, and that is probably something new that he would bring to French politics, is this pro-business approach. He has, you know, uh, approached the Brexit in a very pragmatic way and say, hey, well, you know, France is open, we're very happy to, uh, to welcome you. So uh, I would say, uh, you know, Macron, because he is young and he would be the youngest uh, leader I've probably uh, in, 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 the, in the world, could bring a new energy, uh, a positive energy at a time where the far right nationalist parties uh, or leaders are making gains across Europe, but also in the United States. He could uh, prove what he says, that France uh, is a, he say, contrarian, to show that this wave actually is stopping in France and with his uh, uh, election as the new French uh, president. Um, and so he could potentially become an interesting challenger uh, for the Trump uh, uh, administration in terms of uh, proposing and opposing uh, a different uh, vision. 
uh, including on climate change. He has several times says, said that uh, Trump's vision on climate change uh, was not a responsible one and that it was France's role, uh, especially as uh, the country that had hosted uh, the climate change uh, uh, conference and who played a key role in having this uh, final agreement uh, to, I quote him, to bring back Trump in the Western bloc and in the camp of human rights and progress. So that could be, I would say, an interesting, uh, uh, I would say, addition uh, in the transatlantic um, uh, relationship. Le Pen is stuck in a complicated situation. Uh, Le Front National is traditionally, as you know, anti-American, uh, anti-NATO. Uh, um, uh, we don't want to receive orders from the United States. In fact, uh, Front National doesn't want to receive uh, uh, orders or to be dependent on anyone, neither Germany nor Brussels, and even less uh, Washington. Trump has kind of changed that a little. Uh, she celebrated Trump's uh, election. Uh, celebrated his first executive orders, the immigration ban, that she would definitely would want to implement in a French version if she got elected as president. But she doesn't agree at all with his foreign policy decisions, uh, the strikes in Syria, uh, the military escalation vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And she uh, uh, very bluntly say, I don't understand why Trump is you know, contradicting his America first policy and suddenly getting back to the world's policeman role. So, She's kind of stuck uh, in, a, in a contradiction there, uh, and that's going to be a little complicated uh, for her to, um, uh, to manage. Then comes, obviously, Russia, the relationship uh, with Russia. Um, Macron was actually the only um, uh, candidate uh, to uh, not uh, take uh, a, I would say, pro-Russian position. If you look at Fillon, if you look at uh, uh, Le Pen, Mélenchon, uh, you realize that uh, he was pretty much isolated when it came to the relationship uh, with, uh, with Russia. Uh, his uh, position is very classic. It would be business as usual as well, which is uh, open dialogue with Russia on key issues, yet uh, stay firm on the sanction and on the implementation of the Minsk uh, agreement. Le Pen is totally at the opposite. Uh, you, she, she went to visit uh, Putin uh, a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, she has a very pro-Russian uh, vision uh, of the world. Uh, and in fact, the link between her campaign and Russia uh, are, uh, are, are, are quite real. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to see who in the world uh, supports Le Pen. It's basically, at least in a vocal way, two uh, major leaders. It's Trump, who has not been hiding in his tweets that he supports uh, Marine Le Pen, and it's Putin. And just having these two foreign supports tells you a lot about the international vision that Le Pen has uh, of uh, the world. If you look at Macron, uh, I mean, it's all over the place, all of the EU Brussels uh, leaders, um, you know, have applauded uh, Macron's uh, uh, victory in the first round as the, the, the front runner. Uh, Angela Merkel, uh, uh, the German newspapers, if they could vote, they would vote for Macron. Uh, so you have different supports coming from different parts of the world, but it tells you a lot uh, about, I would say, the vision that these uh, two um, candidates, Le Pen and Macron, have uh, of the world. This leads me to Europe and the German-French uh, relationship. Uh, um, Macron <coughs> is really uh, a convinced European, uh, that's for sure. Um, everything he's been doing as the uh, economy minister has always put a very strong focus on Europe, but also on the uh, French-German uh, 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 relationship. Um, he believes in the interdependence between both countries. Uh, Germany obviously needs France uh, to help keep the Eurozone together and outreach to the southern uh, countries, but also to project military power 
in uh, the, uh, the, the South and to make Europe self-sufficient uh, in defense. And in fact, uh, Germany has evolved uh, in that domain, uh, training uh, Peshmerga uh, in Iraq and supporting uh, France militarily in Mali. So there has been some evolution, some rapprochement uh, on the security defense domain uh, from the part of Germany towards a uh, uh, French uh, leading role on this issue. And vice versa, Paris uh, obviously needs Germany uh, to relax its stance on deficit, to start consuming more and to move towards further Eurozone integration. And so the idea of Macron uh, is in fact to first, uh, uh, as all presidents have tried to do before him, implement the structural uh, urgent reforms that France needs uh, economically, uh, especially in terms of the labor market, in terms of the fiscal policy, in terms also of the working hours. Uh, and there he has an interesting uh, uh, position. We can get into more details uh, in, the con in the conversation. Uh, so that uh, France could uh, rise in this bilateral relationship as a more balanced partner. And his idea is to really build what he calls a co-leadership between France and Germany in Europe and get out of this asymmetric uh, relationship. This obviously will not happen uh, tomorrow, but will take uh, uh, time. But this is something that he's really uh, uh, convinced uh, about. Marine Le Pen is the totally opposite um, she uh, believes that Germany is imposing its vision uh, to France and that uh, we shouldn't be taking lessons uh, from uh, either Berlin or Brussels. And in terms of the Frexit uh, debate, <coughs> uh, as you know, she uh, celebrated the Brexit uh, decision uh, as a, a liberation of the British uh, from the uh, EU uh, uh, institutions and bureaucracy. Um, she has nuanced her discourse throughout the campaign and now her idea, at least for now, has stopped to the fact that she would uh, uh, very quickly, if she gets uh, uh, elected, uh, do a referendum on uh, whether the French people want to remain or exit uh, the EU. And if the French uh, wish to uh, remain, she will you know, take that into uh, account and uh, will not um, uh, start uh, the process of exiting the EU. She would, however, would want to put uh, for uh, reforms within the EU institutions. But that's not, I would say, really new. Even Macron or even uh, the candidate uh, Fillon have all included in their programs the necessity for EU institutions to uh, be, uh, be reformed. Uh, so she has uh, nuanced her, her discourse. Uh, and let us not forget, as I said at the beginning, that if she doesn't have the, a majority and she will not have a majority uh, at the, at, uh, in the parliament, she will actually not be able to implement uh, this, uh, this program. Uh, so uh, she will be stuck anyway, and her powers will be completely constrained in terms of the decisions she can take in terms of the EU. And on that specific topic, recent polls show that her idea of Frexit is in complete contradiction with what the French people want. Um, French people feel European. Um, part of Europe, yes, uh, we need to reform uh, European institutions, the way it's working, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and try to bring more coherence in terms of uh, fiscal policy, in terms of managing the refugee crisis, in terms of managing uh, terrorism uh, across Europe. But the French do not want to uh, exit uh, the, uh, the EU. So her, her, sh she will probably uh, be stuck in that sort of contradiction, and probably the May 3rd uh, debate uh, where she will confront Le, uh, Le Macron will probably highlight the contradictions, especially when it comes to her policy vis-à-vis -vis Euro, the Euro, uh, the EU, but also NATO, because she obviously would want to get out of the NATO uh, military uh, uh, structures. Um, so, and so to, I would say, basically um, uh, conclude, I started with, uh, you know, uh, Trump, uh, the transatlantic relations, Russia, Europe, uh, UK, Germany. 
Um, I would end up by saying that, uh, you know, someone like Macron obviously uh, would um, uh, be much more a uh, president of uh, continuity. Uh, there is not going to be uh, huge surprises, even though his book, a campaign book called Revolution, is about bringing revolution in the way politics is made and in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the vision uh, of France will be outlined in Europe and the international scene. Uh, it is obvious that it will be a lot about continuity with Hollande's uh, 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 presidency. He will probably add a more uh, pro-business um, uh, approach. Um, he will probably um, uh, try to move into what he tried to implement as the economy minister of Hollande in terms of the, um, I would say, implementing a sort of Nordic style, a Scandinavian style uh, model of uh, uh, economy by bringing more flexibility into the labor uh, market, by allowing companies to decide about the working hours. You know, we have this 35 hours weekly <laughs> working hours, which is obviously a problem for uh, French uh, uh, growth and uh, economic model. So he would want to uh, reform that. Um, so, you know, as I, as I say, uh, to, to summarize it, uh, Macron uh, is uh, a gamble, uh, a political uh, gamble. And I think that the vote uh, that people... Uh, uh, you know, uh, put for him in the first round, they were gambling on the fact that he was a young uh, candidate and that he would probably bring a new energy uh, for France. Um, Le Pen obviously is um, a danger, uh, a danger for France, uh, for Europe uh, and uh, the world, uh, that's uh, for sure. Uh, and obviously the May 3rd uh, debate will be probably extremely decisive uh, in terms of understanding their, uh, their visions uh, and their opposite visions uh, for France in Europe and uh, in, um, in the world. I'll end up because um, I am the director for Transatlantic Think Tank in, in Paris with what I thought was really interesting, uh, uh, General uh, Jim Mattis' recent vision, uh, visit in the Sahel uh, just a, a few days ago. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, uh, asking, uh, calling for the next uh, French president to continue uh, France's uh, commitment to fighting uh, terrorism in the region. I quote him, he said, I have no doubt that the French will continue to make their own decisions in their own best interest and that the terrorists will not enjoy these decisions. Um, and so it's interesting to see that p from the part of the you know, Trump administration, there is a lot of concern about what is going to be the outcome of the French uh, presidential election, but there's also a desire for stability and continuity when it comes especially to cooperation in terms of uh, uh, fighting uh, terrorism uh, in uh, the Sahel. Um, there is a lot of concern in Europe as well, uh, Germany has been the most worried uh, country, uh, watching, uh, looking at uh, the French presidential elections. A few of my German colleagues said, uh, uh, nous sommes tous français, we are all French. Uh, and uh, we can understand that because the outcome of the May 7th uh, election will determine a lot of things, not just for France, but also for Europe and more broadly uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the world. And I don't think it's exaggerating um, uh, saying that. Uh, so I'll just end up with, um, with that. And uh, by saying that it's not just uh, about the next president, but it's also about the next composition of the French parliament. Uh, because the election of the president on May 7th is just the beginning of a first phase which will be much more challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, if uh, Macron gets elected, uh, hopefully uh, uh, he will get a majority and that this will allow to have a, a political stability. But at that stage, 
uh, it's still not, uh, I would say, uh, absolutely uh, sure, uh, considering the fragmentation today of the French uh, political landscape. So let's keep our eyes also, I would say, on the second legislative elections phase, because it will actually be uh, extremely uh, decisive in terms of what the next French president will be able uh, to, to do.